Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you, Jack, for putting the show up in your gallery. I hope everybody's going to go up and see it after this, if they haven't seen it yet. Um, this is the first gallery show that I'm doing in San Francisco in the 16 years that since I started doing these Art World series. Uh, I felt like this was the place to debut this show because these are pictures that were taken in the Bay Area and uh, also in Tahoe. And I felt like this was the place to do it. There's also a book that uh, accompanies it. And uh, Shannon Jackson has written a great essay uh, that's in the book and, and kind of touches on a lot of this. Uh, the things that maybe we're going to talk about today. Um, I felt like rather than just do a talk about my show, that we would try to, uh, I got this panel together so that we could discuss maybe how it fits into the wider Bay Area art community, which is what I'm interested in in, in the projects that I've done, about how we all interact with art. And uh, Jack kind of gave you a quick, uh, recap of the series that I did. It was 16 years ago that I started with uh, Century. I kind of stumbled along upon that series. I was walking in New York City where I used to live in the Chelsea neighborhood and it used to be warehouses there and I went into one of the big spaces. It was uh, Pace Gallery. It was where the contemporary art galleries had opened up their, their big galleries there. And it was just me and this woman in this big space and it was a gigantic white uh, entry desk, and I could only see the top of her head. And so I took out my camera, I thought, this is kind of funny, clicked a picture, moved my camera, clicked another picture. She didn't recognize that I was even there, which is, that's just a weird experience. You point a camera at somebody, they're gonna notice you're there. You're the only other person in the room. And that was strange. So I went down the street, go into another gallery, same thing. Large desk, little head. <laughs> person doesn't notice me. Third gallery, same thing. So that became this series. I spent, I did a couple of trips back and forth to New York, went into every gallery in Chelsea, edited it down to these, and I went to other neighborhoods too, but Chelsea has a big white desk. And I was able to get a show pretty quickly with James Danziger in Chelsea, and then the New York Times and the New Yorker wrote about it, and all of a sudden I was this critic of the art world, and I that was really kind of shocking to me because I thought I was doing something about how we all are maybe not seeing the people in front of us because we're on our devices, we're on our computers. But no, I was, I was doing something that was critiquing these elite galleries that were trying to make us feel uncomfortable. They called it the architecture of intimidation. And uh, so I thought, well, well that's, that's great. That the fact that somebody, that they're all projecting their ideas onto my pictures, that's what I should be doing, work like that. And so I, then I went to Russia to do something completely different and it wasn't working out, and then I kind of stumbled onto these, the older women, the babushkas that guard the art at the, in the galleries of where the museums are. And that became a big series that uh, continues to be shown around the world. And then I kind of went back, now I'm sort of becoming an insider, and I was at some of the art fairs, I had a gallery in New York and LA that were showing me in some of the big art fairs, and so I thought I'm gonna do a series about big contemporary art fairs in Miami during Art Basel, in New York during the Army Show, and also in, in Basel, Switzerland, where the big art fairs had started. And uh, the art fairs are something that I kind of think people inside the art world kind of love to hate. They love it because you can see all this amazing art in one place. There's a lot of it, all kind of uh, from small galleries to big galleries. But they hate it because there's this sort of this marketplace with it. And, and actually, I met Jack about 10 years ago at one of these art fairs, it was in Miami. And so the dealers are spending a lot of money to be there. And so they have to make the money back, otherwise they're gonna lose big money. And so there's this anxiety that's going on, and there's this, the art should be there for people to, to see, to communicate, but there's gotta be this marketplace as well. And so I kind of focused on the dealers in their booths, and you can kind of sense uh, this anxiety. And, uh, it, it went over pretty interesting. Actually, there's somebody who is in a gallery just up behind it. Uh, she, she bought a couple of my pieces, and when I showed her the book, she said that, uh, my God, this just makes me cringe, but, but you're, really, you're really capturing it. You're really getting a sense of this. 
So, uh, it was seven years ago this week that I get an email from Stephanie Breitbart and she says, I, you know, I really want to buy a bunch of your art fair books. I want to give them to my clients. And she lives on the other side of Mill Valley from where I am. I, I said, I'll drive over and I'll give you the books. And then she says, what are you working on next? So I said, well, I've got a couple of series that had kind of had hit dead ends and I wasn't, they weren't working out. She says, you need to follow me. And I go, really? <laughs> well, you can't believe these houses I'm going into. I said, well, let me think about it. Let me think about it. And so uh, a couple days later, I called her up. I said, let's, let's do this. Let's give this a go. And it, it was really, uh, she has a very unique approach to art consultancy. I think a lot of art consultants will go to different galleries, pick out a piece, or they'll go to art fairs, and they'll, uh, when they buy a piece, they get a, usually it's a 20% cut, and then the dealer and the artist split the rest. So she is doing some of that, but also she has her own artists that she represents, and so she has an inventory of their work that at that time was in the house in Mill Valley, but then she was just opening her space, the first space in Jackson Square. And so the uh, clients that she has, and, and this was the interesting part, many of them were newly wealthy tech people who had just cashed in on these IPOs with Facebook, with Google, with Twitter, with uh, LinkedIn, with other companies that I never heard of that were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And, they, and a lot of these people were buying large homes for the first time, and they needed to fill the homes with uh, furniture, they hire an interior designer, and then they need art on the walls. And I was able to listen to the conversations, and they had, most of them had never really bought art before but they have all the space that they, they need to do it. And they're intimidated by those big galleries. And so they go to Stephanie and she is selling an unbelievable amount of art. I just can't believe <laughs> how much, but I never, I mean, I've been to these art fairs, it's not that easy to sell art. And so that was just fascinating to watch that whole process, that these are new collectors, they want art, and how, how do you bring them into it? And it kind of blew up all of my ideas about how people are supposed to collect. And uh, it was just, Fascinating to watch that, but here the visual that I'm getting. I thought I was going to photograph maybe a couple of other art consultants, and I talked to one of them, and she said, "I said, well, she said, well, in a couple months I'm going to do a delivery." And I said, "Are you going to be installing it?" And she said, "No, no, no. I have I hire the professional installers. I'm trying to figure out how is that going to work." Because Stephanie, one of the things that she does that's unique also is that she is hanging the work herself, and she has. A great her team there, and she has this great uh, art installer, art handler, Monica Perez. I don't know if she's here, but uh, and also her uh, and uh, and then some of the other partners are doing this as well. So they're bringing all the art there. She, when I show up, she's already emailed the clients. Andy come along. He's taking photographs on a project. They either say yes or no, and actually many said no. They don't want, they, they looked at my pictures and said, we don't want this guy. Most of them said yes, we don't want this guy in our house. But then, so, so that was the visual of it, which was great. I've got these two stylish women carrying art in and out, very photogenic, like that, those are the pictures. But then I'm thinking, I don't, I, you know, it has to be maybe something more. And uh, there's a curator that I had worked with that, uh, Cantor Museum, which is at Stanford, she did a show of my guardian's uh, work, and I told her early on that I'm doing this series, and she said, this is going to be a great historic uh, portrait of the Bay Area, you know, during this time. And I thought, oh, this is, this is, so that planted the seed, okay, I've got to include other things. It can't just be the art. I have this permission to be in the houses, but I want to get all of these other details that are going on. It's a very narrow slice of the Bay Area, yet, there's all the stuff that's happening, and then you've got cleaners. Every house had a cleaner. Every house had a landscape. There's nannies, there's chefs, there's all kinds of construction going on up and down every street that we went into in Appleton, and Orinda, and Los Gatos, and Ross. And uh, there's this whole economy that's happening. And so that, uh, I wanted to include a lot of that. And there's also the kids, because it was usually during the day, so the little kids on the devices. So you'll see that in, in some of the pictures. And then there's the dogs. Uh, I learned about Labradoodles because we went to, there was one stretch where there were four houses in a row where everybody had a Labradoodle. 
Stephanie happens to have a Labrador, and they come in small, medium, and large, and black, white, and beige. And so that was one of the discussions that, that happened there. And there's a picture of the Labrador that's up on the show. So, uh, let's see, I'm gonna let Stephanie, I'm gonna let Stephanie talk a little bit about her, uh, you know, what she does, and then maybe we'll go on and have Shannon and Natasha kind of expand on this. I have a small black Labrador. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Breitbart. I founded uh, our, our consulting team, yeah, this is about 16 years ago. We started out of my house, um, very humbly, just going around my home. Um, and then uh, it sort of started taking off. We began primarily as our consultants and then sort of expanded it to represent our own artists. About 10 years ago, we opened in Jackson Square. We have a home gallery space there. And then about five years ago, we opened in Menlo Park because we found that more than half of our clients were down in Silicon Valley, Atherton, and the Park area, and none of them had time to come to San Francisco. So we needed to have an outpost down there to service that, that clientele. Um, in a nutshell, I would describe our sort of unique gallery slash art consulting business. I, I sort of sum that up for people sometimes by saying, galleries sell a product and we sell a service. We really focus everything we do on being customer service oriented. So from our galleries always being a group show where someone can discover a range of 50 artists up at one time, because a lot of them are new to buying art and really need to learn their own art tastes and understand what they like, to telling them where it goes in their home, what looks good over their couch, what looks good with other artwork in their room, how do we curate the home environment. So really, galleries often will create shows in a gallery and the art fairs, we're creating homes. So we're going into clients' homes and we're like this blend between a gallery, an art consultant, and even an interior designer, but all we do is the art. Um, and these clients, we found that more than half the sales are come from the South Bay. Um, they have a, a lot of disposable income, they have beautiful homes, they are very senior in what they do in their professions, but they're new to really the acquisition of luxury goods in every regard, from decor to artwork to other elements in our lives. And they hire us as trusted advisors to help them create this beautiful, compelling, unique, personal art collection in their home that's meaningful to them, that they want to raise their kids in, that looks good in the home, that looks good with their other artwork, and so on and so forth. So we're really full service from them coming to the gallery, discovering their art taste, to photoshopping it into their homes, to loading up our Mercedes Spider Man and showing up and unloading it, which is what all the photos are, hanging it on their walls, uh, doing the installation ourselves, all free of charge. Um, you can amaze these clients how um, they, they're willing to spend, you know, hundred to hundred thousand dollars on art, but they will bulk at a thousand dollar delivery fee. And so even the element of just taking that out of the mix and saying, we'll be there next week, we'll show up at our spare hand, we'll like, no, nope, we'll install ourselves. You don't have to pay us in 24 hours, like some buyers will say, we need a deposit for you to take that order. We just make everything easy. And when you combine that with having an aesthetic sensibility and a curatorial eye for guiding them, here's who's good out there right now, here's who you should be collecting within the art world, and here's what looks good in your home, these are sort of the package of services that we found really to offer clients. So we're now a team of seven women, many of them are here, sprinkled throughout. Um, and uh, we really love doing what we're doing, and uh, I'll pass on. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and welcome, everyone, and congratulations, especially to Andy, um, as well as to Stephanie and the star of the show, um, for this exhibition. Again, I'm Shannon, and I did have the privilege of writing an essay for a catalog that accompanies the exhibition, but I've been following Andy's work for a while before. Um, I thought it was Based on writing that essay and other talks about Andy's work, I have a couple of points to make. Uh, one, I wanted to think a little bit about love and money, about the emotional and economic dynamics that we see in these photographs. I wanted to say something about institutional critique, which would be a kind of longer genealogy of our practice, which we might see in Andy's work. Something about the Bay Area and what it means to think of the Bay Area as part and parcel of, it, of um, a regional economy that's also an art economy. Maybe the last thought about Stephanie and what it is to be an art investor. So first of all, uh, we titled this uh, ex this gathering close to home. It's also the title of the essay that I wrote. 
in part to get us to, to sort of isolate the really complicated emotional and transactional dynamics that um, I think you see in those in many of these photographs. I thought I'd start actually with a paragraph that opens my essay just to get some words in here. Um, because it was sort of my attempt to try to get inside the work a little bit. Okay, so here we go. But the scene is lush and carefully composed. Trees, vines, bushes, and shrubs grow around the perimeter of the sparkling school pool. To the left, a lounging teen taps on her cell phone. Ankles precociously crossed, flip flops set ready, a can of something carbonated promises refreshment. On the beautiful grounds of what is like being her beautiful home, the cell phone gives the teen something to do. It also gives her a reason to ignore, or to pretend to ignore, what's going on around her. Indeed, behind her, a faceless figure approaches, hidden from view by the large painting that she's carrying. We see the top of the figure's head and a bit of her hand, along with her sample feet below. She resolutely walks while the teen resolutely taps. The teen may or may not decide to notice the no-nonsense schlep of her family's <laughs> argument. Um, a service worker in her home, to use your language. Um, but also just to think uh, about how much, as Sandy says, what it is to be inhabiting these homes, to be so close to homes that are newly minted, um, uh, homes that are um, multi-million dollar homes um, made from people who are, uh, uh, bought or designed by people who are newly minted to millionaires and who, as Andy said, um, need an art collection, need it rapidly. Um, but also in all of those dynamics and these you know, transactional dynamics, there is this odd and strange um, and compelling intimacy that we're allowed inside of these homes, that private dynamics are put out on public display. Um, and that, of course, building a collection is usually, in building a private collection, you're building it for your home. The home is, is the center of it. Um, it's also a place where we see uh, all the dynamics around love that also circulate around money, of what it is to raise a family, what it is to have a dog, what it is to, to care for and to, and, to, and to speculate about the possibility that you might actually have succeeded at your dreams. You feel all of those emotions there, next to some of the complicated social and political dynamics that Afghan has described. Even also within that, that too, I wanted that phrase close to home to have um, that uh, metaphoric, that metaphoric sense of how we use it when we're talking about the feeling when an intervention or a joke hits its mark or hits too close to home. It hits you um, at a certain place that might feel a little uncomfortable, in fact, very uncomfortable. And that moment when you feel implicated by what you see is also a, a time when we tend to use that phrase close to home. It's hitting too close to home. And I think it's useful to inhabit that space for a minute rather than to be repelled by it or avoid it or not want to implicate it or be too guilty or whatever, to sort of inhabit it and think think about what those emotions are and then what perspective it yields. That type of edginess and that cringiness, which it was Andy's word at this time too, I actually also think it's interesting to pan out broadly past not only this particular exhibition, all so much of Andy's work in photographs that has been taking a, a, a documentation of what you could call the back end elements of the art world. Uh, the, the security guards, the, the, the transactional market of um, the art of the art of the art of the contemporary art world, as well as um, uh, what it is to be a, a volunteer or docent in the in the Hermitage, where you're um, where where you also feel many of uh, the, the, the docents or guides or security guards have an attachment to Russian art history and uh, and and who are they and what are they? So. Uh, Andy has always been thinking about that back end uh, element. And in many ways, I see a connection between that and a wider practice of what sometimes gets dubbed institutional critique in the art world, where many artists over the course of the 90s and early 2000s began practices that made art about the art world, made art about the institutional politics of the art world, whether it was, say, somebody like Daniel Grohm, who's 
uh, making architectural interventions that help us notice the dynamics of the museum. Or Fred Wilson, who goes into a collection and also installs varieties of um, pieces and sculptures that, that uh, address the racial history and racial service history of the museum. Andrew Fraser, who performs uh, museum doses in order to get us to think about the dynamics uh, internally and economically of how a museum is funded, how it services its, um, its clientele. That all of that you can sort of see those artists are using performance and sculpture and an installation to uh, stage institutional critique and that Andy in some way is using a photo practice to stage um, a kind of institutional critique of, um, of the cultural world. But in this case, in this case in the exhibition that you, um, we have here uh, today, we're bringing the Bay Area as a region into this institutional critical vision. So it's, I think, interesting to think about what, what it might mean to have the Bay Area as subject matter, but it's subject matter precisely because it is also um, the, an environment and an institutional system uh, that has affected the art world today. That it is um, a place where the technologies that um, circulate and connect us globally and connect the global art world are ostensibly invented here, right? Uh, that it is also, it's also a place when we think about the relationship between technology and Silicon Valley and the arts, it starts to bring up other more immediate and recent um, uh, debates that emerged some of you may know about a fairly ham-handed article written uh, and published in the New York Times after Case Gallery and Cozy Gallery uh, attempted to install themselves in the Bay Area and departed, and there was this moment of uh, uh, where... Case, <laughs> wait, still here. Sorry, go back. Case, yeah. it's still here. It's still here, never mind. <laughs> okay. So we'll get my back. Sorry. But the whole thing about whether these galleries were going to succeed or not succeed, that must be a sign that the Bay Area is not ready to really embrace the arts. Uh, and there was a variety of um, blinkered thinking uh, in, that whole, in that whole essay, but it brings up, and that seems to be part of what's in the air. We'll hear more from Natasha um, about exactly those dynamics. But those of us who've been in the Bay Area and lived in the Bay Area for a while and have thought about the relationship between art and technology in the Bay Area for a while also know that there is a really rich history of interaction uh, with the Silicon Valley, between the so-called Silicon Valley and artists, including early histories of the Rock Park that brought artists into the labs in order to um, uh, uh, mutually co-create. So there have been a lot of very, very important connections between the arts and technology in the Bay Area, even if we understand now things are, that the dynamics are differently fraught. And of course, it probably is the kind of wealth that Andy and Stephanie are depicting in these photographs, the kind of newly minted money that perhaps um, led uh, uh, galleries from New York to think that they could swoop in here at the last minute and make some money themselves. So we need, need to acknowledge that. Um, and at the same time, also, it seems that this is a, a, a chance, once we're sure we don't agree with articles like that, to really think anew about what kind of world we are inhabiting and what kind of world we wish we might inhabit in the future. And this is where I close on this idea of the art advisor. Um, certainly, as Stephanie says, her practice is a unique practice. Not every art advisor is the same. In this case, we see one art advisor practice with many homes. Um, but there is something, while not unique to the Bay Area, that something about this art advisor profession, as Stephanie is describing it too, that really I think it is emblematic of certain dynamics in the Bay Area of how our ever new economy, uh, experience economy works. As, as Stephanie says, she's not just selling objects, she's selling services. And that, and, and that it's very much in this situation, this situation where you might have old school skills as an art historian, you might know the pedigree of the artwork and all of that, but all of these soft skills where you have to become a kind of almost a family therapist, an interior designer, somebody who understands the pet peeves of people, their favorite colors, that understands the emotional dynamics of the family, the love and money, and as it circulates, it's all, it seems to be part of the emotional landscape that someone like Stephanie is navigating. And what it is to 
work uh, as cultural labor in this mode. It seems very uh, intriguing and interesting for our region. Um, in, the, in, in some ways, I also wonder in general about what the future of art advising might be, but also to ask, to use that word advisor, to ask all of us, all, all ourselves, what kind, what kind of advice would we give ourselves about the next future and region we want to co-create together? together with Etsy and, and um, I actually created this, Gina. I, I, I created a brand, <laughs> sorry, um, which was called Craft Bar. And what Craft Bar was is that you would come into the museum. Am I, is there an echo? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So Etsy's, we created a partnership with Etsy, which was very exciting. 
just, just sat down across the table with the CEO of Etsy and I pitched this idea, which was Craft Bar, where you would come every Thursday night in Yerba Buena Lane and you would pay five bucks, you'd get really good craft beer and a craft project with a San Francisco artist uh, who would then instruct you through the craft project, like Barry McGee would come and he'd make a doll with you or whatever. So um, that, I thought, was a very fruitful model for a kind of collaboration, um, as well as uh, the other ones that I mentioned. And you mentioned Xerox Park with John Winnett and Margaret Crane, who were really embedded in Xerox Park, which that was something that we saw more of. I'm going to give another example, and then I'm going to loop back to the, the context again. Um, I have up here the Facebook Artist in Residency program, uh, which is a amazing book because it's actually analog can you open it up i love the fact that it was facebook but it's a it's an embroidered binded book that we did so the contradictions of analog and tech are rampant but we might sit around and want to critique and i know andy said we should be talking about how we were publicizing our talk on facebook well, I'd like to point out that if whatever we think about Mark Zuckerberg, he did start, uh, there is a history, and I write about it in this book, where um, supporting artists and local artists, David Cho, I mean, everyone knows the, probably the story, it's mythological by now, but it went on to become, uh, between 2012 and 2017, an extremely active artist in residency program, which I was involved with on campus, at the Facebook campus, at the Frank Gehry campus, and really helped many artists in the Bay by commissioning their work on campus so that back to this close to home, you would be working at Facebook with artists like Alicia McCarthy or Randy Koloski or some of our favorite Bay artists their work was be in your office, right? Or in your open office. And the artists in turn were able to have a residency that was paid and productive and um, they were supported. It was really fun because we got to have free food and pass, you know, to the campus. So everyone was very excited about that um, for that it, for that period of time. Uh, and I, so I think we have to be really careful when we create oppositions. And I think Andy's work has that ability to sort of, sort of rot, that kind of liminality, um, that uh, Duchampian, Afrasen, like invisible, uncomfortable impact. Like when you sit on a car seat and you get up and there's your butt print and you're like, Wow, I got a, you know, I've got a big butt. But, uh, but really, the work is uncomfortable. And it, I find it incredibly uncomfortable to sit on a panel with an art advisor who's the subject of a series of photographs of art and the way that it, it, that process of bringing art into the home is depicted. Because I have a very different relationship to art making and artists so to see that um, in the photographs really uh, makes you want to be even more radical and more committed to radical localism um, and move a further away from the commercial art world <laughs> so thank you did i respond to some things <laughs> and also Yes, I'm very honest, but um, I'm also a serious art historian of local and regional recent art history. So um, I, I really do, I'm speaking from uh, the heart. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that as a dealer, it makes me really uncomfortable to have done this. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, it's it's an uncomfortable place to be in, too. Um, what I was saying is that as a dealer, it's a really interesting, peculiar place to be in to show the work of, you know, the relationship that I, as an art dealer, have had with art consultants over the years has been fruitful, uncomfortable, 
And to have it exposed like this makes it even more scurvy. <laughs> you know, seriously. And, you know, it's the transactional aspect of it you know, now that's just even, you know, over the top. So thank you. I mean, I really do like being uncomfortable. Seriously, I hate talking like this, but... And it is, it is my intention that, that I'm not trying to... You know, I used to make... Some of the earlier art that I did was sort of beautiful nature pictures. I took to a photo review I had done. That, that was the last show I had done here. And I got killed. I mean, they were like, no, don't do this. And then I saw what was being accepted. And then I realized that if I wanted to, to have any impact and to, to show something that people would be interested in, I needed to kind of challenge people. And so I had been a photojournalist for many years before that. And so it was my job to kind of really try to understand what's going on, make a picture that goes with somebody's story. But, but working with journalists, trying to figure out what the story is, what's going on. And it's not always comfortable. But I always loved art, and I know, and I had my ideas of what I thought was great art, but I learned so much really by going to the art fairs and, and understanding. So I, can, I would sit in the booth with my, my dealer, and, he, and he's, just, he's just doing photography, but he's got five different kinds of photography there. And so five people would come in, and each one is coming to look at something else, and uh, four out of five are not interested in my work at all. And once I got past that, I was really fascinated, why are people interested in the other work and just talking to them? And everybody brings their own ideas. It's all subjective. And that's, it's interesting, it's fascinating. And once you get past the idea, well, we all have different opinions about things. And it's, it's, it is really cool when I find somebody who's maybe doing something similar to me. But I'm actually more interested in the guy, I became friends with the guy who's doing these minimalist pieces that were, that I never would have been interested in. And I went to his studio and I saw what he did. And they're just beautiful, beautiful pieces and completely different art than what I'm doing. And so, and, and also seeing the, the, thing, the things that you were talking about, for me, it's just fascinating to see the wide variety. But I also know some people are just focused on one thing. And that's, and that's fine too. Like, why isn't that fine? And I also see that the, that was what was interesting about watching people who were not, hadn't really thought about art, and all of a sudden they want to have some things in their home. What do we do? You know, where do you start? And, and I think it should be open to anybody to kind of start somewhere. And, I, and actually, I included a lot of kids that were that are in the pictures. I'm, I'm thinking about it all the time, why I'm shooting this, what's going on, and I'm having conflicting things. And I'm seeing the kids there, and it's like they're watching this, and so their parents weren't exposed to art as a child because they don't have that. But now their child's exposed to art, and they're going to inherit that art, they're going to inherit the money, and they may become somebody who's going to build a place like this or uh, have a collection like up the street here that's the you know, McAvoy collection. How many generations is that? From the money, I had this experience, one, one last thing, the experience this summer with uh, a museum in Finland, and it was, uh, they showed my all four series together, and actually it was the first place that showed this series. And uh, because of COVID and the delays, they, they got to put that in. But they, that uh, collection started 100 years ago. It was a paper uh, lumber baron, collected a lot of Finnish, the best Finnish artists, and also some European art. And he, uh, when he died, he wanted the collection to be shown as a museum. And 100 years later, now his family sold all their, their holdings, but they're still incredibly wealthy. And they want, they're, they're building this little art town. And they built a contemporary art museum next to the old building. And they're, they're putting on unbelievable shows. They have some keeper. And, and so there's that idea that it's got to start somewhere, and it can build other uh, things. And, and, there is room, I think, for this wide range. And that, it's interesting, and then also that, that, that uncomfortableness is something that, that I think gives us a chance to think about. I'm sorry if what I do makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> I think what it does, if you let me finish, please. Um, and what we do is we, is the ultimate in helping local artists, actually. 
So I didn't we say that, selling, Stephanie, you know that. We started with selling all local artists. So when you say, do you want to be in homes, or do you want to go this career route through galleries and being critiqued and, and going into the art world, they still need to sell, and they still need to make a living at what they do. So ultimately, what we began with was helping local artists and helping new collectors buy their art. It graduated with our services up to this really more um, uh, wealthier, for lack of a better word, um, you know, group of people who right now aren't being addressed by the art world. These clients, this is a lot of people, a huge population in the Bay Area that are not being spoken to and aren't appealing to the gallery world as it exists right now. It's, in my opinion, why Gagosian wasn't successful here, and I know Pace has had its struggles. And I think what the majority of the galleries right now do is they all go after a similar aesthetic collector who is buying art for the resume of who the artist is and where they're going and you know, what they're adding to in their collection. Um, and that world is pretty foreign to our groups of collectors that we're dealing with. And maybe they're not collectors per se, I mean, the old world might, world might be yet. But they have to start somewhere, right? And I, I think that these clients will eventually become what you want them to be in terms of caring more about the resume of who they are. And this is part of the art education that we do with them. So I think that the whole world, the whole, for lack of a better world, but this sort of intimidating um, gallery world, I think, um, can come off as um, not very welcoming, as judgmental towards, um, towards people who are new to the art world. And I think, I think my understanding and acceptance of that and not being judgmental of them and accepting them into the art world as who they are and what they're able to bring to it and sort of educate them about art and starting them off with collectors is a great thing to do for the broader art community because I think eventually they will start you know, spreading their wings and buying more established artists. And Absolutely, like and that's what I meant when I said, and I made it very clear, there are many different art worlds, there are many different economies, and there are many different discourses, and I wasn't setting one against the other. So you misunderstood me, I'm sorry if you did. But I will say, I wrote an article in Dwell Magazine in 2000 where I uh, basically interviewed three uh, collectors and actually wrote about how to create your uh, collection. So I've been at this for a while as well and I've sat on multiple panels on collecting in the Bay Area. So no disrespect to the advisor at all. I think you misunderstood what I was trying to say. I was wondering if we could open up to questions. I'm sure there are many people who would like to ask questions. Are we passing the mic? Yeah, I guess so. And then there's one behind you you can pass out. Stephanie, I would like to ask you how many artists using technology have you placed in the new collectors' homes? And if the number has been very small or zero, my question to you is, why not? Uh, I'd say it's been small. Uh, traditionally, we sell paintings, sculpture, and photography. Um, the photography we sell is, most of it is just you know, the images, the raw images, it's not digitally manipulated images or any kind of photoshopping involved. So for the most part, we're not selling, we don't do um, video um, work, not yet at least. Um, and so for the most part, we don't sell a lot of artwork that's integrated with technology. So I guess in that sense, maybe it's a little more traditional. And then one there and then one there. Hi, the, the first thing I want to say, thanks, this, this really interesting talk about all the different art worlds, um, because it, are, it is a big universe. Um, and it seems like a lot of what you're doing is curating for your clients, um, because their experience is walking into a gallery like Andy did in New York 10, 15 years ago when he began the whole process, and you know, it is austere, and you don't feel like you belong, and it's a strange connection. It's, I think it makes a lot of sense that you know, some, you know, you're able to help people make that connection. Um, but I also was curious, um, since talking about the big art world in the Bay Area, I'm curious um, what you guys think about the fact that 
um, a straight institution like the San Francisco Art Institute um, is no longer. And what, what does that say about you know, where we are and why can't a city like ours, as rich as it is, um, support um, a, a great art school, a beautiful, one of the, seriously one of the greatest buildings in the city for most people who haven't even been in it. That is one of the prized buildings in the city, um, as well as having the Diego Rivera, which they talked about for way too long about perhaps we're moving and selling, which is really a terrible, terrible idea. But how do you feel about how that fits into this equation of you know, art and Rivera? Question. Obviously, the art schools are the labs for ideas, and I would say that many of my students, uh, I've taught at the San Francisco Art Institute, many of my students have gone on into the tech world because they're incredible problem solvers. They study painting and, the, and, uh, and sculpture or new medias, and they are essential to the tech economy and how they how they think and produce. So there are lots of examples of that. So I'm a huge supporter of art school because it's not just about making a pretty painting, but it's actually about critical thinking and the possibility of problem solving and the possibility of coming up like Phil, our, our friend Phil Ross who came up with um, but in the mycology world, having gone to Stanford um, for his BFA, and he now has a huge company in Emeryville that's pretty much solving a lot of our problems through mushrooms and making things with mushrooms. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm sa deeply saddened that the Art Institute has closed down, and I understand the reasons for it in the Bay Area. But I would say that's a great example of sort of a loss of, um, of creative talent. And we hemorrhage creative talent every year in the Bay because people can't afford to live here. So it's something to be aware of. I'll just I'm going to take the other question, but I did want to just add that um, in addition to talking about the art sector and the technology sector, your question brings up the education sector. So just to note that a school is different and also that school and education um, is, is, is so important socially for so many reasons. Uh, and I think it, the, the difficulty of having a school um, be sustained, whether it's in the arts or not, is part of what, what you're talking about. And sometimes education is inefficient. Really good education isn't necessarily always something that you can sort of streamline and iterate and put online. We all learned during COVID what does and does not work online in education. Um, even even if we are always told, as I'm a professor at Berkeley, we're always told that we should that that's the efficient way to do the, our teaching. So I think there really is a social question there about how we together. <laughs> mobilize our love and money uh, in order to sustain education as much as we are the arts. Uh, nicely said, Shannon. So um, I, uh, I really, I have to say this architecture of intimidation really hits close to home. I think uh, we've all experienced it quite a bit. And there's a long, rich history of, of art, the art world's narcissistic practices. Um, the question I have for, for you, Stephanie, is the people that you're dealing with, and you found a way to talk with them and get, get really connected with them, is something I'm, I'm curious because I'm imagining many of them are, are engineers. They're, they're technical, and they come from a different background, right? They may not have had as much exposure to the humanities. I mean, this is the world I live in where engineers, you know, they may not have many social skills. <laughs> so, how do you, how, what is your, what's been your insights in dealing with this people? Ken is dissing his field here. Ken is speaking about himself. So, yeah, so every, the majority of our clients either work in technology or they work in finance funding the technology. 
and we do their homes, and then we go and do their offices. Like we've done Kleiner Perkins and Advent and major, major names in the finance world, and we'll do their offices as well. Um, they don't, at the beginning, they don't, they don't value the art world like we do. So you have to come to them with lack of judgment and lack of snobbery, per se, for lack of a better word, and really talk to them about why they should own art, um, where to begin collecting art, uh, how to develop their own taste and point of view about it. The first step is showing them a lot of art. So to me, that's step one. The more art you see, the more you start developing your own point of view of what you like and what's good, and you hear about pricing, you start understanding, okay, what's value in the art world? So that can be achieved by going to a bunch of galleries. It's not the most efficient use of these people's time that I'm dealing with because they're all very busy. They don't want to drive to San Francisco. They need a whole house full of art. They don't just need one piece. And going to one gallery and seeing one artist up at a time is not that efficient for them. So that's why I developed this a different model of just having a rotating group show at all times. That's a start. But often we will go to other galleries as well. And that's a launching point for me to start to understand, do they like photorealistic art? Do they like abstract? Do they like sculpture? You know, different, their tastes. Um, from there, that can be a launching point and we can go and see other galleries. And we've even a couple of times brought some clients to Art Basel, but that's, that's less than all. But um, it's, it's the beginning for them. And it's the start of a discussion. And what I have found after doing this for 16 years, is that they do evolve and that their tastes evolve as they get sort of what they thought was you know, their ideal art or what their, you know, they thought was the, what they should spend on art at the time, absolutely evolves. And five years later, they're much more um, adventurous and, and open to more conceptual art and art that might have more of a story behind it. Um, and it, that can evolve. But that's not to say that the initial art they bought also didn't have its own unique story. I mean. You could call it commercial in some ways um, because we are selling so much. So maybe it's commercial from that perspective. But every artist that we work with is a career devoted artist. Several of them are here um, who are you know, amazing full-time career professional artists doing incredible work. Um, and you know, it's, they're more emerging to mid-career. They haven't been deemed you know, up in the blue chip hemispheres yet, and they're not you know, selling at auction, they're not big names, they're not in museum collections, they're emerging to mid-career artists, so they're you know, more at the beginning of a career. Um, so it, it's really, a, we develop a long relationship with these clients. It's not, it doesn't, it's a journey, I tell them. Art, art collecting is a lifetime journey. Their tastes will evolve, their opinions on how much they should spend will evolve, um, and how they feel about it in their homes evolves. So we definitely have them coming back to us for more and interesting and different points of view and to expand their collections as they grow up to. much of the popular taste of your clients, buyers, collectors, directs the production of the art itself? Um, not much. Uh, the artists make what they make. And, you know, we select it through our own, I guess, aesthetic lens, like any gallery does, of what you think you can, what you think will be appealing to your clientele. And I think different galleries really do have different aesthetics and vibes and nuances to the, the stable of artists that they work with, right? So, um, you know, ours, like any other gallery, probably has sort of its own, you know, point of view a little bit, and are more pop art oriented, probably, things like that. So, um, no, I, I, I bring in artists that I think will be appealing to our clients, but we don't uh, tend to, I mean, we don't tend to direct too much. I, Direction is in the form of what's selling, maybe. If, you know, if we're selling a lot of something, then I think that's direction in and of itself, and it's sort of up to the artist if they want to keep making what's selling, or if they, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they want to explore a new venue, so. Thank you. Hi. Um, 
Let's see. Let's take this one. Hello? Another baton. Hi. Uh, thank you all. I really was mesmerized by what you have to say. I am an advisor in Los Angeles area. And I would say you are all right. There is no one way for a collector to buy art. My approach is different from yours, different from yours, different from an academic point of view. Um, and I think the Bay Area, in spite of what the Times may say, is as vibrant as ever. I think there's a difference between the commercial sector and where the talent lies, for sure. And I've been here for four days, looking at artists, looking at studios, and I have to say it's as vibrant as any other region in this, in this country. So congratulations on getting it in there, getting it in the door, I think is one of the most important things you can do. So.